All right, welcome everyone. Today, we're gonna to be talking about acquisition entrepreneurship. That's a big term. How you are better off buying a business first and then growing it and how to do it, how you can actually buy businesses, even if you think you can, rather than starting a business from scratch and how to grow it. And my guest is Walker Dibel. He is the author of The Bible on Acquisition Entrepreneurship, Buy Then Build. It's a wonderful book, so stay tuned. Welcome to the Smart Business Revolution podcast, where we feature top entrepreneurs, business leaders, and thought leaders, and ask them how they built key relationships to get where they are today. Now, let's get started with the show. All right, welcome everyone. John Corkin here. I'm the host of the show. My guest today is Walker Dybal. I'll tell you about them a little bit more in a second. Of course, if you've seen some of my interviews, I've interviewed all kinds of smart CEOs, founders, and entrepreneurs of companies ranging from Netflix, Kinko's, YPO, EO, Activation Blizzard. Check out the archives. There's lots of episodes there for you. Of course, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, where we help B2B businesses get clients, referrals, and strategic partnerships with done-for-you podcasts and content marketing. And you can learn about us at rise 25 Dot com And uh, Walker, such a pleasure to have you here today. Walker Dybul, the serial acquisition entrepreneur. He's sold just a ton of books. He is an Emmy-nominated film producer, uh, you know, <laughs> interesting background. He's done a bunch of acquisitions. He's run a bunch of businesses. He's got the Acquisition Lab, which is really the premier business buying accelerator for entrepreneurs. Really interesting community that he's built there. And he's acquired a bunch of different businesses over the years. I read his book. A while back and i know that he's spoken to a bunch of different communities that i belong to always to much acclaim and i'm really excited to finally get a chance to talk to him and he also is a partner with quiet light now quiet light is a client of our company one of my favorite clients to work with they're do m a mostly for online businesses and for SaaS companies and stuff like that so we'll ask about his involvement with that as well and walker such a pleasure to have you here today and i love to start at the same spot which is tell me about little side hustles that you has had as a kid. And you said that you had a knife sharpening business. I'm picturing little seven-year-old Walker going around with butcher knives, but what was that like? John, first of all, thanks so much for having me. It's it's an honor to be here, a long time in the making, big fan. So just want to start there. Thanks. Um. So, okay. So I was, I was not that like, you know, that kid with like the, the, you know, the newspaper route and all the rest of it. I, I was not, um, incredibly entrepreneurial. I, I was a little bit more artistic. I was really in the film and like the arts and all this kind of stuff. And I wasn't really hustling for that next dollar at those young ages. However, um, I've got a couple of memories. Um, one probably inappropriate, but we'll go there anyway. The, the first is the one you mentioned. So so when I was, um, I, I really don't remember. I want to say I was in like first grade. So like, how old were you in first grade? Seven. Eight, nine, Six, seven, eight. Seven, eight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my parents had just bought this electric knife sharpener and brought it home. And my parents were complaining about how dull their knives were mm -hmm. and about how, you know, and basically I saw that like there was, you know, I mean, now in, in retrospect, I can use big words, but like I saw that there was this infrastructure of knives at everyone's house in the entire neighborhood that were probably dull, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and because of the electric knife sharpener, we were we were able to sharpen them incredibly fast. Mm -hmm. And um so, you know, I used a copy machine at my father's uh, office and dropped these um uh, flyers in every mailbox across a three neighborhood span. And um John, I'm happy to report I got one client <laughs> um, and when I went to retrieve the knives, they, you know, I went up there just like I had nothing to carry them. So they just handed me a bunch of like kitchen knives <laughs> and I carried them like down the hill. And then I, of course, returned them in record time to a complete surprised, you know, adult who was like, how on earth did you get this done? Yeah. And I realized at that point that there's a there's a gap between value provided and perceived value. Mm. And uh, for whatever reason, I uh, I did not get a repeat customer, but you know, right like, because yeah. you don't need your knives sharpened all that often. Yeah, <laughs> <Right>. maybe <laughs> once a year or whatever. Right? Yeah. So yeah. that that was one, and then um, second, um, when I was in high school, um, I began to experiment a little bit with uh, marijuana. That is uh, now as one does now legal in this state, and um, 
uh, it, you know, I saw that people were, I basically figured out the economics pretty quickly, right? And it was like, you could buy an ounce of this, sell it as quarter bags and, you know, basically make, um, <clears throat> I have no recollection what a quarter bag costs back then. Can we just say it's 50 bucks? Sure. So it was like we'll you buy an ounce for 150 and then you sell each bag for 50 bucks. You make 50 bucks. It's a 25% margin. I was like, this is great. Mm -hmm. So, um, I found a source, uh, bought an ounce of weed. <laughs> Um, you know, swag in those days, there was, you know, it was still sort of like the, the afterglow of the sixties, I guess, like kind uh -huh. of and hadn't found their way into Missouri, but, um, two things, one totally nerve wracking. Cause I was always driving around with the weed in my car. Right. And, um, so you want to make extra sure that you're not high driving around because sure. you're, you know, if, if you end up talking with a, with a police officer, any kind of authority, you don't want to hint that you have this, uh, stash. Yep. But here's, here's the thing. Um, I was at a friend of mine's house and I had the weed in the car and um, I asked this guy who showed up if he wanted to buy some. He said, yes, I made my first sale. OK, oh. 50 bucks. OK. And um, about a half an hour later, <clears throat> I got a call. This was before cell phones. So the guy called the guy's house that I was at. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. Somehow I knew I was there. Hello. This was one of the biggest drug dealers in St. Louis <laughs> telling me that I had just uh, taken his customer into back off. <laughs> oh, geez, man. Nice of him to place a phone call, and not show up personally and flash something at you. <laughs> yeah. at that was um, that was that was an interesting, interesting move. But uh, so those those were those were my two early endeavors. Damn, you must have uh, you must have been looking over your shoulder for quite a few <laughs> weeks afterwards after that. Yeah, you know, that John, I mean, just to expand this a little bit, um, you, you touched on film production. What I would say is that um, um, one of the things that happened while I was in college was we actually made a film uh, on the side. There's a whole story here, but um, that film we ended up, it took us about four years to make it. Um, I'm, I'm, it's like the, um, I think I can say this. It's like the worst movie that you've never seen. So please don't go find it. But we you got to tell us the name of it then, if you're going to say well, we, that. We sold it to Lionsgate, right? And oh, so I, I, oh. I'm in it as an actor, right? Mm. I, I was not the writer. I was not the producer. I was not the director. I really was a producer. Um, mm. But like my credit is as an actor. And it, we got it sold to Lionsgate. And um, so when I graduated from college, we just had this, you know, I had like one resume bullet point, which was like, hey, you know, I worked at the music store. Oh, yeah. And I sold this movie to Lionsgate. And it was like, wait, mm. what? <laughs> it was yeah. it was one of the last movies to hit the the new releases in VHS mode at Blockbuster before uh <laughs> before they shut down. But I saw yeah. it. I saw it. It was But there. you made it. You made it. And it, so um so I grew up in in Los Angeles and I actually my dad was a um film critic when I was growing up. So I grew up around film a lot. My first one of my first jobs after college was actually doing uh they call it script coverage, re reviewing inter you know reading scripts for the great Polly Platt, who won an Academy Award for broadcast news. So, but I was around that world, but you went to college in, in Kansas and you were an English major like I was. Yep. How did you fall in with like a film crowd? I mean, you, you know, it's, it's like I said, like it was sort of, um, okay. So there's sort of like version 1.0 and then there was version 2.0 and then there's this bridge. Okay. So um, how, how do I say this really fast? First, I would say, me and a friend of a friend of mine, a, a, a childhood friend of mine, middle school friend of mine, uh, was the one who wrote, directed, and produced Defiance. Okay, and uh, my involvement in that film started with me and him in a room. Okay, and then that film is what what ultimately, you know, five years later, sold to Lionsgate. And then, um, then there, then I sort of went, you know, my own direction, right? And then there was a moment in time I'll never forget where I was sitting there at my desk at the at the book printing company that I owned. And my college roommate, who then went to Los Angeles and became Scott Rudin's assistant. And like the first film they worked on was The Hours. They won the Academy Award and all the rest of it. And um, a person that I'm, I know will come up in this conversation, who's now my partner, Chad Trawine, both of them called me within a four day period. And they both had a similar question, which is, hey, I'm making this movie. Would you like to invest in it? And I was just like, I, like, I, like, I, guys, I'm, you know, I, I bought a, like, I'm running a book printing company. Like, I don't know who you think I am. Like, I'm not, 
this is not, you know, like I'm not in doing sick cash flow over here. The Great Recession is on. You know, you know it, it, that does get to a good point though, because when yeah. you hear someone bought a business, you immediately yeah. jump to, oh wow, they must have a lot of money, which doesn't always have to be the case, right? Because no, you can finance right. it. So that's, that's that's a great segue then to some of the approaches. So so your your acquisition of this printing company, it actually was a brick and mortar printing company at a time when people was everyone was thinking digital. So talk yeah. a little bit about that um, that kind of contrarian approach of of going after acquiring a old school printing company. Yep, let's talk about it macro, and then we'll get specific if that's okay. Sure. You know, basically, it's one of these things where um, during my MBA, I, I was trying to use it as sort of a career shield to start a business from scratch, right? And you know, we we were in competition for you know the the award, and like had some investors lining up and. You know, we had um, a na national customer who wanted to buy and roll out our product and all the rest of it. And it was just one of these things where there was this Achilles heel on the business. And sure enough, um, the, the, we didn't own the IP and the license was pulled from us uh, right at the end. Right. And so the whole business went to zero immediately. Years later, I sort of tried it again. But but um, the, the point was um, in a major way. Right. Like, like, you know, like recruited an executive from Microsoft, oversubscribed the capital raise, all the things. Right. And, um, it, you know, what, what I learned was that I was not very good at startups, right? And there's a couple other I'm not even mentioning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the truth is, is that I feel like we all sort of go into startups kind of like, you know, Han Solo flying into an asteroid field. It's sort of like, don't tell me the odds, like, I'm fine, I'm going to make it, right? You know, <laughs> right, right? Right, right. But the truth is, is that all you need to do is look at the data to understand quite blatantly that, you know, starting a business from scratch and having it succeed is just punishment for not understanding statistics. Like the odds are very, very much against you and you <laughs> right. really can engineer it in a much better way than like, hey, I have this dream and I'm going to hustle for a while and then sell to Google, right? It's just it, like, that's not going to happen, right? It's just mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. And I hate to crush dreams. The, the other thing that was going on was, um, you know, I, I was getting my MBA at Olin School of Business here in St. Louis. And, you know, I'd walk up and down, you know, like wide on Boulevard, like one of, one of the most wealthy, you know, or a drive through Ledoux, one of the top 10 richest neighborhoods in, in the country. And, you know, although Silicon Valley was sort of getting all of the attention and all of the magazine covers and all of the everything, I would look around and be like, I'm in one of the top 10 richest neighborhoods in the country, and there's not a single internet entrepreneur living here, like not a single tech, like, what are they doing? And they're not doing any of the stuff that we're reading about. <laughs> they were, yeah. you know, just salt of the earth kind of companies. And it was like, okay, well, look, I mean, you know, this guy makes, I remember sitting next to this guy and he made the, um, he made the, you know, that, the the outer rim of, Light bulbs, real, or light fixtures. Yeah, for light yeah. fixtures, yeah. right? Yeah, and I was that, like, that, okay. that ain't getting getting displaced by uh, digital technology. Yeah, and 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 you know, it turned out there was like two players in the space, and he was one of them. You know, and, and mm -hmm. it was okay. This is awesome. Like, I need mm -hmm. to look. No one's looking, right? Um, so I, you know, when I graduated, I was like, all right, I'm going to try to buy a business. And, you know, what the first thing I noticed was, first of all, let me let me pause on that. Was that crazy? Because it, it it often depends on the MBA program. You know, some MBA programs, everyone's going to Wall Street, everyone's going to a big firm. But but were you like kind of the black sheep if you're like off going, I'm going to start a buy a business right now? I mean, John, no one was doing it. OK, yeah. there was there was a few people doing it in Cambridge at that time. OK, and I had heard of this concept of a search fund that was sort of originating in Cambridge. But like um, it was it was not uh, anything. In fact, I had an MBA uh, professor try to talk me out of it, told me it was stupid. Mm. Right. It's totally always a dumb idea. I, I loved that. I relish in the fact that 17 years later, I went back and launched the entrepreneurship through acquisition class at my alma mater. But whatever. <laughs> like, like, like it was bonk. It was nuts. And John, the thing is, is that like as I started to look for a business to buy, people are like, oh, it must be nice. You have a lot of money. huh? And I'm like, no, I don't have any money. <laughs> And, and they're like, what are you? And I'm like, well, it has like earnings and like history. Like, I'm just going to go to the bank. And they were like, what? Like, it was, mm. you know, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, there has to be a way to do this, right? Mm. So, the, you know, the thing is, is the first thing I realized was that um, here I am coming out of B school, right? There's no organized information on this kind of like lower middle market, main street, private business stuff. And literally didn't have a course that had a section on it. Nothing, wow. nothing. 
there was nothing. And so it was one of these where, you know, in 2018, I published By Then Build. It's really the book I wanted in 2004, right? And it was like, okay, how do we do this, right? So, you know, the concept here, just to answer the question, just to land this. When you <clears throat> buy an existing business, I often think of it as like money ball for entrepreneurship, right? In other words, you're stacking starting, the odds in your in your favor kind of thing. You're starting yeah. by getting on base, yeah. right? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm starting with existing revenue. I'm starting with product market fit. I'm starting with, you know, specialized knowledge in the head of employees. I'm starting with infrastructure. I'm starting with, you know, profits mm -hmm. and cash flow, right? And then, um, and then just to make it even sweeter, in my opinion, a lot of people look at me and they're like, that's so risky. But here's the thing. The cheapest capital out there is from a bank. Okay, SBA loans today are like, you know, 11%, maybe even higher. I don't care. It's still way cheaper than going and, and raising money from a bunch of investors. If you take money from an investor in my book, you owe that money back to them, right? It's not like, oh, there's like, we'll just kind of good thing they believed in me. Hopefully I'll make it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. my opinion, you cannot take that money unless you have every intent of returning it. And hopefully with a really good return, right? That's what, that's why they're giving it to you. Not, not because they're like, oh yeah, just go for it, kid. Like that's not, that's not what people yeah. are thinking. Yeah. So, you know, and, and, you know, if you're buying these businesses that, you know, let's just, let's give you a big range, right? Like two to five times earnings, that's two to five years of earnings, getting a bank loan, right? And then buying that infrastructure and taking it over, then slowly or not so slowly making it yours changing the culture, changing the paint and growing it. Right. Yeah. And what it does is, is it brings real estate economics to entrepreneurship. With what do you mean by that? Yeah. When you buy a building, right. What you're doing is you're saying, Hey, I'm going to go to the bank. I'm going to get a mortgage, small down payment, buy the building. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to put someone in there who's going to rent it. And that their rent is going to pay down my mortgage. And over time I get the equity buildup. Right. Mm. And I get to go sell it. Yeah. Right. So the difference is that when you buy a building, uh, you maybe have a 2% appreciation over time. And when you have a business, um, not only are you buying, like on a building, a cap rate might be, say, a number, 6%, 8%, 10%. If you, if you equate cap rate, if you're familiar with this term, to, to you know, business acquisitions, you're, you're talking about like often a 35% cap rate. I mean, it's way cheaper for the cash flow, right? And then your upside potential is not 2% a year in terms of what's the external market going to allow for appreciation. It's what do I bring to the table and how am I going to grow this business? Mm, yeah. Um, so there's so much I want to ask about here, but um, in terms of the search, searching for a company to buy, mm -hmm. where do you recommend people start? Obviously, there are companies like Quiet Light that have listings. Sure. Um, there's also just doing in, you know, a search in your geography or in your network. Um, there's evaluating what you'd be good at and what you should go into. What do you, what do you advise to companies in terms of where they should look and, and what industries they should look at? Sure. So there's a lot in there. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, I tend to ask really big questions that are impossible <laughs> to answer. Uh, let's see, let me give it to you two ways. Okay. The, the first is let's talk about deal flow. Cause that's the first thing everyone wants to know about, right? Like, where do I go to get this deal flow? Right. right. Um, here, here's what I've learned in almost 20 years of actively doing this. Um, go to business brokers. Okay. Uh, because business brokers are the ones that have the deal flow and they spend their entire careers generating deal flow. Okay. Uh, moreover, um, they're working with sellers who a want to sell, which is like more than half of the situation, okay? Mm -hmm. e, B, they've been coached on what to realistically expect in terms of evaluation, okay? Which is an important point, especially oh right gosh. now, yeah. Yeah, oh you can unpack that right? a lot, yeah. Yeah, so those two things alone, you're already 80% of the way home just by mm -hmm. opening the thing, right? Now, now third, I think people that ha don't have experience with this will, un will, underestimate, will oh, grossly underestimate this. Um, I've been in so many deals, like I think I've done over, I've been in some version, I've touched over 200 deals, we figured out last week. And um, 
in every single deal, there's a moment in time where either the seller or the buyer, like they just have to walk away, right? And there's mm -hmm. this thing in M&A, which is like, oh, if the deal doesn't fall apart two or three times, then it's definitely not going to close. <laughs> and it's, it's truer than that. Like, like if yeah. it hasn't fallen apart and we're going into closing, I'm actually pretty stressed. because I'm like, mm, it doesn't fall apart. apart. It's too smooth. Like what's, yeah. what's going on? <laughs> the broker, a good broker, okay? And there's a difference. But a good broker is the person who coordinates the mutual goal of the buyer and the seller, okay? And just having that person there to get it across the finish line. So as a seller, um, I have sold two companies uh, with a broker. And um, if I sold again, I would use a broker. And every time I've been amazed at how they accurately price it, find the buyer and get the damn thing closed, mm. right? Sellers, just so you know, if you focus on proprietary deal flow, which e even back in 2004 to 2006, people I was talking to were like, oh yeah, I don't go to brokers. It's all about off-market deals. Mm. I tend to think that this is sort of um, adopted in real estate thinking. Right. And like people want to find that off market deal because you make yeah. money, you buy yeah. and all this kind of stuff. I, I think you make money when you sell in, mm -hmm. in, in business acquisitions. And I think that um, finding someone who's going to sell it to you, at, you know, you know, three times or times like, come on, like whatever, you know, people say, like, should I buy this deal? It looks a little expensive. I'm like, if it's expensive, you know, what, what do you want to get? And they're like, oh, like, you know, I want to I want to buy it at three point two X instead of a three point seven. I'm like, OK, mm -hmm. so you're talking about like six months of earnings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how are you gonna own it right you know like let's, yeah. let's take it down like are you really just nervous about the risk you're taking like let's you know anyway mm. um the point is is that um sellers go to brokers when they eventually want to sell like more than 90 percent of the time even when i talk to traditional search funds like people who and we talk about what that is you know People who yeah. raise money to run a search and then they raise money again to, to buy a business, okay, two-step process. They'll spend 24 months and they'll spend, you know, they'll spend a month doing broker outreach and then they'll spend 23 months working full-time, cranking, trying to do proprietary deal flow and every single one I've ever met in person. And I'm like, yeah, where'd you find that deal? They're like, broker. Your broker, yeah. I'm a broker, yeah. Yeah. And often, often it's like, oh, it's someone I talked to two years ago, and then they decided they were ready to sell. And so they went to a broker and I found the deal that way. Yeah, it, it maybe it, perhaps it might also be like you hear sometimes these lore of like Warren Buffett or someone like, you know, had, was at the tennis club with so and so and like struck a deal, you know, and you, you think that there's kind of like a myth to it, you know. It happens. It happens. Yeah. Right? And it's, it, and the thing is, is like, you have to, you have to be thinking about what are the sensational headlines? Mm -hmm. The sensational headlines are, Hey, I started a business from scratch and grew it to a billion dollars and went public. Uh, you know, I, I met a guy at the, at the restaurant and bought his company. I have a friend, I have a very close friend who uh, got a phone call from someone he knew who I think it was a CPA or an estate attorney, I can't remember. And um, he said, hey, uh, there's been a death and there's a business here and I'm just looking, and it's like something in e-commerce. Do you wanna maybe buy it? And it was like, you know, 4D, 4Ds, right? Death, disability, mm -hmm. drugs, disabled, you know, whatever it is, so, divorce. So um, he gets a call and he's like, well, you know, what's the situation? And uh, the, the guy, the owner, uh, died um, in his uh, red Porsche 911 convertible uh, <laughs> with um, a large volume of cocaine in the Ooh. trunk. Wow. Um, three guns in the trunk. Jeez. And a million dollars in cash in a briefcase. <laughs> wow. Jeez. <laughs> and wow. it literally is one of the best businesses I've ever seen for sale. And he just got the call. He was like, what is it? He bought it from the widow. He had never bought a company before. Wow. Uh, you know, for three times, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's, let, like let's get back to your printing company because um, I imagine there were some things you wanted to improve about it. And one thing that I yeah. hear frequently a lot of times when I, over the last four or five months, as I've been looking at acquiring businesses and talking to different people, a lot of times they're like, when I describe another business, they were like, well, you shouldn't buy it because it's got such and such problem. Mm -hmm. And people love to point out those, you know, problems that exist, oh, yeah. but then again, that's where the opportunity lies, right? You know, not every business is going to be perfect. So yep. talk a little bit about, you know, that approach and also in specifically in the context of 
you acquiring this printing company at a time when people, everyone was kind of thinking about digital printing? Yeah. So, I mean, just to, yeah. Okay. So, you know, okay. Two things there. So one, um, when, you know, when people are, when, you know, the, the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur minded person is, is optimistic, opportunistic, driven hustle, growth mindset. I'm going to solve this. No one can stop me. I'm bulletproof. Right. And the investor mindset is, let me explain to myself why I can't move forward. So it's really like the accelerator and the brakes, right? Mm. And, um, uh, you know, I think that you have to, I'm not, like, I almost didn't publish by then build because, like, even though it was done, it was done, it was, I I completed writing it, I think in, um, well in first quarter 2018, if not 2017, and it wasn't published until September. And that's because I waited. So I was like, I don't, someone's going to read this and go buy a business. <laughs> and, and you were, you felt like too much weight on your shoulders or something? Yeah, it felt a really? little like, yeah. I mean, no one was talking about this, as you know, right, John? But, yeah. but it was one of these where, you know, I mean, I mean, it's very easy to be pessimistic and explain why something's not going to work. So what I always do when I'm looking at, for a business to acquire, what I want to understand are what are the risks, Okay. There, every business I've ever seen has them, okay? Mm-hmm. Every single business in the world has a reason why it's going to completely fail. Some yeah. of them have three or four, right? Yeah. And what I want to know is, what are you going to bring to the table as the CEO to own and grow this business moving forward, right? Because that's the thing. It's the active management of a business that is the thing that makes it go and move, right? It's that op- entrepreneur part. So, um, uh I lost the thread. There was it was a two part question. Yeah, I think. Um, oh, it was- oh, buying a buying a printing business when no everyone was so. Let, I, this is important. Like, I really want to explain the, the what was going on in the world right now. Um, this was one where no one in our age group. I'm probably a lot older than you. My uh, age. Group, I'm 47. We're probably. I'm, I'll be 47 in 60 days. Okay, okay you, there you go. You only look 45. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> but, uh, but so it's one of these where this was like 2008 when i closed on this print is dead was like the headlines that were going uh, on right like like i bought the company and then um it was it was within the year like the kindle was released right yeah, it, was, yeah. it was like 24 months after you know i bought the company that steve jobs released the ipad okay mm. Printing companies were going out of business at a rate of 36 a week. Okay. Wow. Uh, bookstores were going under, right? Remember borders? Like, I mean, you know, yeah, all, all, yeah. This, all of this stuff kind of went away. And um, there was a couple of things that that I saw. Okay. And you couldn't find them anywhere in the, in the sort of public dialogue. Uh, number one, um, people were very much still buying books and it was like trillions. It's like $2 trillion or a hundred billion or whatever it is. I mean, it's a huge number mm-hmm. like every single year. Right. So, so the industry during that time, and I'm going to make this up because I didn't look at the numbers right before we got on the call, but you know, it basically was like people, instead of buying a hundred billion in, in books, they were buying, you know, 98 billion. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, it was just mm-hmm. like a massive market. Okay. Um, number two, Printing companies were owned by fat cat, gray haired people complaining that it wasn't the 1990s anymore. Okay. Mm. None of them needed the business anymore. They had already put their kids through college. So just like the profile of people that own these companies. Right. And the little thing that I think was really making the big difference was that um, if you're familiar with Clayton Christensen's innovators dilemma, Mm -hmm. there's a point in time where a new technology just peaks above into the range of this is acceptable now for everybody. Okay. Mm. You might remember early digital cameras. It was like, boy, that's grainy. And then mm-hmm. three years later, they just killed, you know, film. It was the yeah. exact same thing happened in what's called digital book printing, which is ultra low run. Okay. Mm. Um, uh, book printing. And so what I saw was the impacts that digital printing was going to have on the entire publishing industry. Okay. Mm. Um, just to reiterate. So, or just to go deeper. Number one, if I'm a publisher, okay, I might have 3,000 titles, okay, but only 600 of them are going to be worth actually printing because I have to print, you know, a thousand or 5,000 copies at, you know, a dollar or two a piece in order to make my margin on them, right? Mm -hmm. But I've got these other, you know, 2,400 titles 
that I own the IP, but like I can't actually print them because like the, back back then that it required more work and typesetting the, and stuff like that. Yeah, inventory yeah. investment was huge. And so if you're yeah. familiar with how the how the internet sort of developed in the long tail, right, of, of mm-hmm. the sort of keywords of like, hey, Batman is covered. Like these people have it. But if you're looking for this really obscure, you know, sort of documentary over, you know, it's sort of over here on this, you know, on this search term and you can get it. I saw the same thing happening in publishing. Mm. So, like, so what I did was I bought the company. Um, I knocked out the pre-press uh, department, put in a bunch of digital book printing, comp- uh, digital book printing machines, uh, called all of the existing customers and said, hey, we offer this now. And, you know, within 18 months, it was like 20% of our business. Mm. And as the, and then the great recession hit, right? Great. So it was like a great recession, books, printing companies going out of business, bookstores going out. The newspapers started calling our customers and saying like, hey, like I'm about to go bankrupt. Can I give you this really cheap pricing to get your printing? And so like we were fighting that for a little wow. bit. Wow, yeah. And uh, it was terrible. And um, yeah, and so it was, it, was, it was rough and it was hard. Yeah. Like this game is hard. This game yeah. of entrepreneurship, I don't care what version you, you have, what version you adopt, it's hard. It's not simple. Yeah. And in a sense, you had a great advantage in that you, it was a company that had a client base, right? It was rather than like a brand new company has no client base. 8 million in revenue. You yeah. Know? I'd go to, I, I, I hung out with entrepreneurs and they're like, oh man, I'm just trying to hit a million this year. You know? And I was like, well, I, I got that covered. Like <laughs> still worried. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, and you know, you've got debt on the business and all the rest of it. You've got, I had, you know, 50,000 square feet and employees and you know, all the rest of it, yeah. you're making change and and, you know, I was 30 years old when I bought that company and I, I look young. Right. And, and so at that time I probably looked like I was right, right. 23. And like, let's talk about that because um, yeah. you write about it in the book. What is your approach and your advice for after a company is acquired coming in and implementing changes? Is it something that should yeah. be done all at once? One fell swoop. If you're going to yeah. lay people off, lay them off. But in addition to that, things like equipment purchases and changes like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the sort of rule of thumb is don't do anything for a year, okay? And that's kind of what I did the first time I bought it. Um, I don't really remember what I wrote in Buy Then Build, but here's what I would say now. I've seen, I've seen it go a lot of different ways. And I've seen people wait a year because that's sort of what they were told. And they want to keep the integrity of what's there. Um, I've seen other people uh, roll in and make change drastic change within a few weeks of buying a company. Okay. Um, am I going to, do I, am I, without, without spending too much time processing, I'll, I'll make an, ex, I'll make the extreme case that every single time I've seen people come in and make extreme changes within weeks, it's never been a good thing. Elon it, Musk at Twitter recently got headlines around that. Yeah. There you go. So, so um, you know, I, I have a feeling he'll land on his feet, but, you know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'll be okay. But, you know, I think the thing is, is that, like, there seem, there's kind of a sweet spot, okay? And I really regretted not making change sooner, right? Because when you hang out and everyone's like, oh, okay, nothing's going to change. And then you, like, try to change things. Like, you know, yeah. you find yourself buying Michael Porter's leading change because you're like, wait, now I can't get people to move now. You, yeah. you know? And when people, when, when you buy a company and you show up and you're like, hey, I'm the new guy, everyone wants to kind of get a read on you. Everyone wants to kind of know like, okay, how do I make this new employer happy, mm-hmm. right? I mean, we're all scared that they're all going to quit, right? Yeah. They're terrified that everyone's going to quit. The truth right. is, is, is that if they find out before the sale happens, they're all polishing up their resume. Mm-hmm. If they find out after the sale happens, everyone's like, okay, well, I might need to be polishing up my resume, but let me give it a minute. Let's see what this new yeah. person is all about. Yeah. Right. And they all stay. It's their job. They're getting a paycheck. Right. You know, yeah. it's not like, you know, and, you know, just don't come off like a tyrant and you'll, you'll be fine. So I, I, sorry, finish that yeah. thought. And then, and then, okay. You good. So I would say, what? I would say there's a sweet spot where like you still have everyone's attention. You still have the high energy. I spend the first 90 days focused on, you know, people, product, people, products, processes. Right. And then if you're going to implement change, I really think that, month After four yeah okay. go, go easy go easy you bought the company because of what it does yeah don't don't overreach don't over right. don't, you know all that stuff all right so i i'm did taking it out of order here but i realized i didn't ask about actually strategies for putting in an offer especially in in this type of market that we're in so for context for those who are listening to it in the future we're recording this in may of 2023 it's been a weird economy the last you know six months or so 
and um, business valuations have gone down. Well, I'll let you, you know, put put uh, context to that, but uh, it seems like that's been the case. Um, and yet expectations seem to be stuck in where they were a year ago, valuations sure. were a year ago. So talk a little bit about, you know, strategies for putting in an offer and getting it accepted. Sure. So, um, you know, I, like on my brokerage role, okay, I spend, I, I only will will spend time brokering online-based businesses, okay? And what I mean by that is e-commerce, content, SaaS, mobile apps, Amazon businesses, et cetera, right? Um, I, I, I have brokered um, brands, you know, products that aren't actually selling online, but like, you know, you leverage dist distributors and things like that. Um, so I think the prime example of this is in the fulfilled by Amazon space. Okay. And what happened was, was um, by the way, you know, these aggregators came out and in a very short period of time, they raised uh, 12 to $14 billion. Okay. Mm. And I had a front row seat to this whole thing. Um, total side note, uh, I met the founder CEOs of three different aggregators that all said they read buy then build, which gave <laughs> them the idea to do the roll up in the FBA space. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Wow. But um, the, um, so I take credit for the whole thing. For all the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, uh, but uh, so you're, like, you're, you're getting the drink at the bar. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. exactly. yeah. But, but, but it's, it's sort of like, you know, they really, when I saw them coming in, uh, I saw, I, I was like, oh man, this is going to be terrible. This is, this is going to be really bad. And what happened was first, the early ones, you know, if we went to market and I got, let's just say three offers every single time, this FBA aggregator was the worst offer. Hmm. Cause you know, they're, you know, they're trying to like do deals by the books. They're trying to like do all this, like, you know, uh, middle market stuff on these like sub $5 million transactions or whatever. And it was like, you can't do That's not how this works. So there's this weird learning curve. And they were sort of, um, I don't want to say bottom feeding, but it's sort of like they, they were buying below average businesses at favorable terms rather than, you know, if you, if you go all the way to like, you know, um, the Harvard search fund investors, they're like, find a great business and be fully prepared to overpay for it. Like, that's mm -hmm. what you want. This was sort of like the opposite, right? That's what's. Mm -hmm. Then they got really loud and all the money came in and all these firms started fighting over each other and the valuations just went way up because there was not enough business. There's not enough Amazon businesses to satisfy, you know, $14 billion in, yeah. in capital. It's just, it's just not available. And so, you know, people started saying, Hey, uh, if you refer your friend and we buy your business, we're going to give you a Tesla. <laughs> and so they were basically telling people, I will give you a Tesla if you don't use a broker. Mm. That's, a, that's a clue, just so you know. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> just so everyone's aware. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But the, but the thing was was that um uh you know valuations went way up, and then they all started overpaying, and I saw it happening, and then they all got um, upside down, we'll call it, with their lenders, and they mm. couldn't meet their terms, and so all the deals stopped closing, mm. right? And now the valuations for those businesses have come right back down. Mm. Okay. Here's, here's what I want to underscore. I'm, I'm going to get to your, to your exact question. Um, in 2018, uh, when I would list an Amazon business, other e-com entrepreneurs would say things to me along the lines of, more often than not, this was it. Why on earth would I buy an Amazon store? I would just launch my, a product myself, mm -hmm. right? And I was like, hey, it's up to you. you know, this is a great product, five stars. The multiples were, were probably about a 2.4 times on the, at, that, at that time. 2018. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By 2021, people were getting between five and 10x valuations. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of terms along, a lot of deferred, but I mean, the valuations were huge and they were getting you know, maybe three and a half to four x cash at closing, right? And then mm -hmm. all this other, you know, deferred stuff. And um, what's happened now is that, you know, valuations have come down from this uh, peak, which was completely obvious that it was going to happen, happened yeah. sooner than I thought. Um, but, you know, it's still above where it was before this all started, mm. right? And the popularity of buying existing companies has increased. COVID, especially in the space, COVID was a good one where people are like, why well, now I just want to be at home all the time. So can I buy a four hour work week? Yes, you yeah. can. <laughs> well, buy you can buy right. one. You know what I'm saying? Right. But, the, but the thing is, is like, um, when sellers you know, get this idea in their head that like, oh, okay, my business is worth, you know, 10 million, 
instead of three million, it really messes up the market for everybody. Yeah, else. yeah, yeah. So you're in you're in this period of time where it's not yet. Um, I wouldn't say it's a it's I wouldn't say it's a buyer's market yet, right? I mean, there's the sellers still have, you know, it's there, there's fewer supply that meets demand in this space, and um, I'm specifically talking about the FBA space. Yeah. And um, the, you know, the valuations are, you know, it's, it's just, I agree. There's a separation between where the seller thinks it is and, and where the buyer is willing to pay. But um, the, the buyers are the correct ones. Yeah. So let all the sellers know that. I mean, I've seen this market for 20 years and I know like, you know, the buyers are correct right now. And so mm -hmm. there's just a little bit of a gap while the sellers need to come down their expectations. And all the sellers need to do is look at their year over year performance to prove it to themselves. Mm. Yeah, it's inter it's interesting because a, a mentor of ours recently said, you know, I don't think that it's a good time to buy a business right now. I would wait three months and see what shakes out just because it's a weird transitory period now where expectations are kind of coming down. Um, we're, I, I want, I'm mindful of the clock here and um, I want to ask about Acquisition Lab because this is fascinating. You built this incredible community, 500 or so members now, mm -hmm. all mm -hmm. who are interested in buying and selling businesses. Um, obviously, I think it it came out of buy then build. So talk a little bit about what you're doing there, John. Thanks for asking. Um, so okay, what what happened? I, I shared that I got this idea for buy then build in 2004, right? It was about 2008 um, when I was at the printing company. Uh, it was about 2010. I was at the printing company. We got a new customer, okay, and this customer was Veritas Prep, and we printed all of their books, okay, and um, they basically were kind of like the premium. Uh, they were the elite uh, test prep option for people taking the GMAT, right? So it was like, look, if you want to go to an Ivy League school, you know, and you're going to take the GMAT, what are you going to do? Go, go study with Kaplan or Princeton Review like everyone else? Like you need something better. You need something sort of elite. Uh, but we're not elitists, right? But here's, here's, the, here's your path. And I saw that and it really inspired me to think like, wow, what if there was kind of like an accelerator, right, for business buying that like taught people how to, to do this, right? And so I got that idea in 2010. And sure enough, after Buy Then Build came out, um, you know, to this day, I probably get, you know, 10 to 12 people a week that are like, hey, can we jump on a call? Like, let me pick your brain or, you know, I'll get like, a, I'll get like an email yeah. info from someone I know around St. Louis. It's like, hey, you know, I met John, he wants to buy a business, maybe asking a coffee or something. I'm like, I, like, I can't, uh, no. I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I said to myself, okay, I like all of us have been in these sort of like, you know, masterminds or whatever, where you go in and it's like some version of here's a Facebook group of a bunch of blind leading the blind and no one's actually going to take action. And the person who won was the person who started the mastermind who got all our money. <laughs> right. It was critically important to me that that is not what we're building. It was like, how yeah. do I build the sort of Harvard? How do I build the Y Combinator, right? How do I build the elite version of this? Now, mm -hmm. the irony here, John, is that I was also the first. And there are, um, I shouldn't use the word copycats, but I don't know what else to call it. So, so like, there's, there's, there's options now. Like, we're, we yeah. get called, like, why should I pick you? And so it's someone else. And I'm like, mm -hmm. who, who, who's someone else? We're even talking about, you know. <laughs> But the find out about a new competitor. Exactly. Yeah. So we sort of engineered um, the premium option from the beginning. Mm. Uh, number one, it was um, VET. So to this day, uh, the highest uh, acceptance to application rate has been about 30%. Okay. We're just looking for people who we think can actually do it. Okay. Mm. And have access to a little bit of money. If you come in and say, I'm going to spend zero dollars of my own money. I want to buy a business for no money down and all the rest of it. It's really hard for me to help you succeed because mm -hmm. you're bringing no skin in the game and like you want everything for nothing. And that's just like we talked about things like that happen, but like I can't fill a classroom of people and get all of them that result. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I'm looking for the right people and um, our bar is really low. I don't want to scare people away. Anyone mm -hmm. listening to this podcast is in, trust me. Mm -hmm. um, but but the thing is, is like, so vet and get a good, strong community. The community is such that I can't even believe I'm a member right now. Like, mm -hmm. like just so strong. Um, and and how much of the community is like, uh, would you say like professionals, like they're in private equity or they're doing multiple acquisitions and how many are like yeah. newer people? It's so there's a few profiles. Uh, my absolute favorite is like, hey, I started a business from scratch. I recently sold and there's no way in hell I'm doing that startup part again. So, and like, I know that person because 
they, they, we all know how hard it is to start from, it's hard. So it's like, they want to skip that part. They know yeah. how to operate. They get it. I'm like, okay, this person. Yeah. Uh, the, the second I call them the always a bridesmaid. So hmm. the person who, you know, is the COO, you know, there's somewhere between, you know, whatever, 45, 40. Uh, they've run old. a business, but not owned it before. Yeah, exactly. They made mm -hmm. everyone else rich, probably twice. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're like, wait yeah. a minute. Like, it's my turn. That's that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then it's just sort of like, you know, um, successful mid-career professionals, right? Mm -hmm. And even, even some people, you know, like I like there's a guy in our group that has taken company companies, plural, public on the NASDAQ, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and it's just like, he, he's like, I don't understand the sub $25 million marketplace. So I need, I need to get up to speed. And so you also attract people who are looking to be investors in the space too. Yeah. And um, so, you know, so step one was just, you know, create a vetted group. Someone who I can go to a business broker and say, I have the strongest group of business buyers ever put together. Mm -hmm. And we have that at the lab right now. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, that's maybe a little spoiler alert for what our next step is. Uh, but after a vetted group, second was get amazing reviews. So it wasn't until we got 4.8 star reviews from our members that we decided to start advertising, mm -hmm. that we had it, okay? Because it was just people who would come to me, right? Um, then it was get results. Um, in the last 18 months, our members have acquired um, almost, almost 200 million in transactions. Hmm. And the data is directional, and I probably shouldn't say things like this, um, but it, the, the evidence suggests that you're about 250% more likely to buy a business with the acquisition lab than on your own. Hmm. There, there's some, you know, that's a really hard metric to come up with, right? But it's sort of yeah. like, what, directionally, what's the idea here? Yeah. And what I mean by that is, is about 25% of our members have already transacted on something, right? Mm. Um, so now we've got, uh, now we've got results. And now the next step is, okay, can we scale this a little bit? Can we, you know, so everyone else is really good at marketing. Um, and we've been, I think, exceptional at trying to build the best product. And we've been pretty quiet about it, right? And so now it's like, okay, can we be a little louder? Not too much, but just a little bit. Yeah. And sort of building stronger infrastructure around what we have. Well, so I that, think it. I, I think yeah. it's fascinating. I mean, you know, in in the United States and America, there's the American dream, which is buy a house, right? Mm. But as we've tracked towards uh, more self employment in this country, more entrepreneurship, you know, maybe one day we'll get to the point where the American dream is not just to buy a house, or in addition to it, it's to buy a business, right? You know, I mean, I think that's not that crazy an idea that we could get to that point, John. <laughs> My, the original first chapter of Buy Them Build was was called something along the lines of American Dream, and it was it was all about like the, you know, the the framework of America and like and like what we're made up of and like what it you know. And my my editor Tucker Max, you know, yeah. he's very blunt. He's very blunt, and you know, he called and he was like, I don't know this like some people just like it when you get to the point. You need to eliminate this whole chapter. <laughs> <laughs> it was this sort of like grandiose, like you know, where yeah, I love that. I love yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Um, I, know, I know we're just about out of time. So, and I love asking people about um, uh, I, this gratitude question. I'm a big fan of gratitude, especially expressing gratitude to those who've helped you along the way, especially peers and contemporaries. However, you want to define that could be other authors, mm -hmm. could be other entrepreneurs, could be yeah. other acquisition entrepreneurs. Who would you acknowledge? Who would you want to thank for helping you in, in your journey? I mean, John, it's a long list. Um, <clears throat> You know, like just to rattle off a few names on the top of my head, I don't know if I would choose from my my grandfather, my my dad, uh, my business partners, um, uh, Gary Rogers, who is a, a business broker that I worked very closely with for about seven years, um, Mark Doust at Quiet Light, um, you know, but but the the one that's sort of rising to the top, uh, Howard Smith, I would throw it to uh, the the one that's sort of rising to the top in my mind is Chad Trawine and. Chad was the, like we we brought him up earlier. He's the founder of our co-founder of Veritas Prep, um, and you know he was in the in the publishing space and sort of coming out of Yale Business School, and I was in the printing space coming out of you know Olin Business School, and we were the only people. He was like the only one I interacted with that wasn't like a gray-haired publishing you know guy you know, and we just sort of hit it off right. And he was my customer, but we built a friendship. And after I ended up selling the business in 2013, um, I was doing a lot of different things, flew out to him, uh, pitched him a couple things that I was working on. 
and just sort of wanted to stay close to him because I saw someone who um, he's not 10 years older than me, but he's sort of he's older than me. He's a few steps ahead of me. He was more advanced in his career. He was doing things that was sort of the next level, but within reach. Um, and along the way, we've become partners in a number of different things. So, so he's been my customer. He's been a close friend. He's been a mentor. He's been, you know, an advisor. Um, he's been, um, um, a business partner and, uh, um, you know, I just got off the phone with him about 15 minutes before our call started. Mm -hmm. So we're very, we're very much involved in a lot of different projects. And, you know, there's a few people in life that, you know, all of this is about just having fun, right, John? Mm -hmm. it's sure. Like, yeah. If you're not having fun, why do it? It's like, even like, I've always been driven by money. It's just something that's like, Hey, like what, what's the game? You know, if, if it's super Mario bros, I don't, I don't want the coins. I don't care. I just want the end. But you learn over time, like, hey, I got to get the coins because like, you know, like that's how you get the extra life to get to the end. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. But, right. you know, I've always been financially driven. But the thing is, is that once you get to a certain point, it's sort of like, you know, why, why are you doing this if you're not having fun? And yeah. Chad has been one of those people that has opened doors, uh, made it made it incredibly fun along the way. That's great. Walker, this has been such a pleasure talking to you. Uh, where can people go to check out the book, Buy Them, Build and Acquisition Lab? Sure. So buy them build.com will pretty much get you everywhere. Um, I'm not too active on social media, but I seem to reply to my uh, YouTube comments by then build. <laughs> okay. So on LinkedIn. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a question, go uh, pose it as a question or a comment in, on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Walker, thanks so much. Thank you, John. Thanks for listening to the Smart Business Revolution podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.